come together to worship God not only, but to commune with him as our Father. We're called to do that by Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Let's ask for the blessing of our Father upon our worship in a moment of silent prayer. God addresses us this morning, beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Now let's receive his blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's turn to Psalter number 215. We sing not only of a duty, but also of a privilege for believing parents to instruct and teach their children about the Lord and his ways. Let's sing the first four stanzas, 215, one through four.
in making his covenant with us, God has given unto us his law. We hear that now from Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Then in Matthew 22, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the summary of the law, and you know that we're called to love. And let's remember that in 1 John, where the text for the sermon comes from, we are taught very clearly in Scripture. It's not that we love God, then He loved us, but He loved us, and we're called to love Him. Thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let's turn now to Psalter number 52. We respond to the law of God, confessing he's our shepherd. He guides us, he cares for us. Let's sing the four stands of Psalter number 52.
this morning we rejoice as parents in our congregation exercise the right that they have to present their daughter for baptism. I'm going to read then the form for the administration of baptism found on page 86 in the back of the Psalter. What a beautiful thing that parents want to, you understand, present their daughter for baptism, meaning they want to present her to the Lord. <coughs> Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the principal parts of the doctrine of holy baptism are these three. First, that we with our children are conceived and born in sin, and therefore are children of wrath, insomuch that we cannot enter into the kingdom of God, except we are born again. This the dipping in or sprinkling with water teaches us whereby the impurity of our souls is signified and we admonished to loathe and humble ourselves before God and seek for our purification and salvation without ourselves. Secondly, holy baptism witnesseth and sealeth unto us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. Therefore we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For when we are baptized in the name of the Father, God the Father witnesseth and sealeth unto us that he doth make an eternal covenant of grace with us and adopts us for his children and heirs. And therefore will provide us with every good thing and avert all evil or turn it to our profit. And when we are baptized in the name of the Son, the Son sealeth unto us that he doth wash us in his blood from all our sins, incorporating us into the fellowship of his death and resurrection, so that we are freed from all our sins and accounted righteous before God. In like manner, when we are baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit assures us by this holy sacrament that he will dwell in us and sanctify us to be members of Christ, applying unto us that which we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives till we shall finally be presented without spot or wrinkle among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. And I will interject there, that's basically saying what we have in the text this morning, till we become fully like Jesus. Thirdly, whereas in all covenants there are contained two parts, therefore are we by God through baptism admonished of and obliged unto new obedience, Namely, that we cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we trust in Him and love Him with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our mind, and with all our strength. That we forsake the world, crucify our old nature, and walk in a new and holy life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sin, we must not therefore despair of God's mercy, nor... Continue in sin, since baptism is a seal and undoubted testimony that we have an eternal covenant of grace with God. And although our young children, including Hallie, do not understand these things, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism. For as they are without their knowledge partakers of the condemnation in Adam, so are they again received unto grace in Christ, including Hallie. As God speaketh unto Abraham, the father of all the faithful, and therefore unto us and our children, Genesis 17, verse 7, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. This also the apostle Peter testifieth with these words in Acts 2 verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many 
as the Lord our God shall call. Therefore God formerly commanded them to be circumcised, which was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. And therefore Christ also embraced them, laid his hands upon them, and blessed them. Mark 10. Since then baptism has come in the place of circumcision. Therefore infants are to be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant. And parents are in duty bound further to instruct their children herein when they shall arrive to years of discretion. That therefore this holy ordinance of God may be administered to his glory, to our comfort, and to the edification of his church. Let's call upon his holy name in prayer. Let's pray together. O almighty God, Eternal God, thou who hast, according to thy severe judgment, punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood, and hast, according to thy great mercy, saved and protected believing Noah and his family, thou who hast drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, and hast led thy people Israel through the midst of the sea upon dry ground, by which baptism was signified, we beseech thee that thou wilt be pleased of thine infinite mercy graciously to look upon this child and incorporate her by thy Holy Spirit into thy Son, Jesus Christ, that she may be buried with him into his death and be raised with him in newness of life, and that she may daily follow him, joyfully bearing her cross, and cleave unto him in true faith, firm hope, an ardent love, that she may, with a comfortable sense of thy favor, leave this life, which is nothing but a continual death, and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ thy Son, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Tyler and Brianna, you are asked to rise now to give answer to the three questions. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's you. You have heard that baptism is an ordinance of God to seal unto us and to our seed his covenant. Therefore, it must be used for that end and not out of custom or superstition, that it may then be manifest that you are thus minded. You are to answer sincerely to these questions. First, whether you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore are subject to all miseries, yea, to condemnation itself, yet that they are sanctified in Christ, and therefore, as members of his church, ought to be baptized. Secondly, whether you acknowledge the doctrine which is contained in the Old and New Testament and in the articles of the Christian faith and which is taught here in this Christian church to be the true and perfect doctrine of salvation. And thirdly, whether you promise and intend to see this child when come to the years of discretion, instructed and brought up in the aforesaid doctrine, or help or cause her to be instructed therein to the utmost of your power. Tyler and Brianna, what is your answer? Yes. There we go. Hallie Joe, I baptize thee in the name of the Father of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing at this time the fifth stanza of Psalter number 425. 425 stanza number five.
We are thankful to God. Now let's express that in a prayer of thanksgiving and in congregational prayer. Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank and praise Thee that Thou hast forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and received us through Thy Holy Spirit as members of Thine only begotten Son and adopted us to be Thy children and sealed and confirmed the same unto us by holy baptism. We beseech Thee through the same Son of Thy love, that Thou wilt be pleased always to govern these baptized children by Thy Holy Spirit, that they may be piously and religiously educated, increase and grow up in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they then may acknowledge Thy fatherly goodness and mercy, which Thou hast shown to them and us, and live in all righteousness under our only Teacher, King, and High Priest, Jesus Christ, and manfully fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion, to the end that they may eternally praise and magnify Thee and Thy Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one only true God. Lord, we delight in Thee. We delight in all of Thy works. We delight in Thy work of fashioning children in the womb. And we give thanks for all of the expectant mothers in the congregation and also remember the burden borne by husbands and wives who are not able to have children. We pray, Father, that in thy goodness to them thou wilt yet bless them and comfort them and give them joy in their marriage and in their life in the church. For those whom Thou hast given children, we give thanks. We give thanks for the birth of little boys and girls in health and strength. We take that not for granted. We know that some are born with special needs, that this too is according to Thy plan, for Thy glory, for the good of the church, and we do rejoice in the place that those with special needs have within the fellowship of the church. We thank Thee, Father, for the grace that Thou dost pour down upon parents to be able faithfully to raise the children of the covenant whom Thou hast given. That, that takes much time, much energy, much diligence, and Lord, we know that it's a work that we often fail at, we're so weak, and yet we depend upon thy promise of faithfulness to us and our children. And not only do we depend upon that promise, but we take heart, Lord, and are encouraged by the evidence of thy fulfillment of that promise in not only giving to us children who are born physically, but who give evidence that they have been born again spiritually by the power of Thy Spirit. We give Thee thanks for children who know Jesus Christ and confess their faith in Him. For children who receive discipline in love from their parents and grow from it, separated from sin and willing to confess their sins humbly before Thee. We give Thee thanks for children who are able to receive not only intellectual but spiritual instruction in our Christian schools. And we remember with deep thanks and appreciation the work of teachers in our Christian schools as they work on behalf of the covenant for the sake of the spiritual upbringing of the seed of thy covenant. We thank thee, Father, for giving safety to us and to children in a time of break from school we thank Thee, Father, for being with young people who have traveled for choir trips and other trips as well. We pray, Father, that Thou wilt continue to use the various means and activities found in our schools for the spiritual well-being of the young children and the young people in the covenant. 
We ask thee, Father, to be with the fathers and mothers who have children in the home and give to them what they need to be faithful in the instruction they give, in the discipline they administer, but also, O oh God, in the example that they set before their children. May the children of this congregation be able to say, you want to know how to live a Christian life? Look at my mom and look at my dad. There you see faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that thou wilt continue to uphold us as a congregation in godliness and faithfulness to the truth of thy word. Continue to bless the preaching of the word. Bless our pastor, uphold and strengthen him for that task this morning. Be with our elders as they oversee the life of the congregation, the deacons as they gather and distribute the alms. And Lord, remember those in our congregation who have various needs. We think of those who have had surgeries, those who are battling cancer, or those who have family members who are battling cancer. We think of our sister Marge Offringa, who is, Marge Dahan, rather, who is in a place receiving physical therapy, give unto her healing mercies and strength that soon she may be able to return to her home in good health and strength according to thy will. Lord, how we thank thee that in our trials at home, in the church, with our health, uh, with our minds sometimes, Lord, the mental anxieties and worries and struggles we face in this life are very difficult. We thank Thee that in the midst of all of them, Thou art a faithful God and shepherd. And many needs that we don't know, we know that Thou art aware of all of them, not only with perfect knowledge what our weaknesses and troubles are, but with the power to help us, to preserve us, to bless us. Lord, be with us in all of our worship this morning. Forgive our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry to do this, but there's an announcement that I have to read at this time. I really wish it didn't have to happen during a baptism sermon, so I hope yet that we've enjoyed the privilege of witnessing a baptism. This announcement comes from the Zion Protestant Reformed Church.
Father in heaven, to thee we turn in grief and sorrow and cry, cry, Lord, help us. We cry, O Lord, to thee in anguish, first of all, because thy name has been dishonored. Christ has been dishonored and the church deeply wounded by sin. We're sorry for that. Lord, we come to thee because we know that thou art a God of mercy, forgiveness. We know that Thou didst drown the Egyptians in the Red Sea. Lord, we pray that Thou wilt drown our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. Show mercy unto Matt Cordes. Lord, we are thankful to hear of his confession. We pray that Thou wilt give him grace to know that the sin is taken away, but also to deal now with consequences that do not quickly go away. Be with Sarah, betrayed, hurt. Lord, give her the grace to know what to do, to know what to think, to know how to respond. And to find her comfort indeed in the faithful bridegroom and husband, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the Zion congregation. We, we love that congregation. Hurt, betrayed, confused. Uncertain, maybe, about what the present holds, what the future holds. To have a pastor, to be so happy, now to be disappointed and without a pastor. Be with that congregation today in their worship. Minister to them through thy word. Assure them of love and sustaining grace in Jesus Christ. Be with the elders. Called to a work they don't want to do, but have to do. Called to be faithful in dealing with a pastor who has fallen into sin. Called to remove him from office. Called, more importantly, to care for his soul. And to minister also to his wife and to his children to their congregation in this time of great pain and sorrow. No doubt those men feel empty, weak, unable to meet the needs that they're called to seek to meet. Lord, give them thy spirit, equip them, give them the grace. We do pray for our denomination. Seven vacancies, need for ministers. And we wonder why, why, Lord, wouldst thou take a minister away? We don't know. We confess that we don't need to know. And that thy sovereignty, we believe, is real. And that thy goodness is perfect. And that even in this, thou dost have purposes and plans that are far beyond anything we can think or imagine. We pray, O God, for the pastors. Forgive us for not praying for them as much as we perhaps should. We're reminded that they are mere men, weak, assaulted by the devil, and that they need thy grace 
For without that grace, they too can and will fall. Lord, uphold them by thy grace and spirit. And give us more. Lord, we need them. Give us more ministers to serve the office, preaching the word and administering the sacraments. And though this is a time of trouble, a time of dismay, a time when we may worry and be anxious about the future of our denomination, Lord, assure us that the church is in thy hand and in the hand of Christ, and that thou wilt glorify her. And despite the many weaknesses, infirmities, and sins that are found in the members and in the churches, may we be built up through thy word this morning and the hope that we have. He's coming, and he, Jesus Christ, will appear. And when he does, he will take his imperfect bride, purify her, and make her the perfect image of him. Lord, we long for that day when we will, body and soul, be like him. Assure us of that hope. And hear us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. 221. Longing for revival, great shepherd, who leadest thy people in love. Let's sing the three stanzas. Let's stand to sing 221. that we can put that behind us now and focus again the rest of our service on the joy of the baptism that we have witnessed. We worship God now in the giving of our offerings for the general fund and the benevolent fund.
278 in our Psalters, the fatherly love of God, 1, 4, and 5. Let's sing those three stanzas, 1, 4, and 5, 278. read from 1 John 2, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 3. If I'm taking too many liberties during the worship service, I'll leave it to the consistory to tell me. They haven't done that yet, so I'll take another liberty here. You think of why God gives us infants. All I have to do is look at Hallie and smile. And it reminds me of an experience I had when in a time of pain and sorrow, God was still able to bring some joy through an infant. <clears throat> and that was when the, the night that my brother was killed in a car accident, it was midnight. I was at my aunt and uncle's house. They woke me up to tell me that my brother was killed in a car accident. And um, we were waiting to meet with my parents and the rest of the family. And of course, it was a very sad time. But I always had a memory of the fact that I had a cousin who was a newborn, a little baby girl. And there was some, in that time of sorrow, some joy. And anyway, thought I would relate that, that that's one of the many, there are many blessings that God gives us in giving us children, but just to be able to see an infant in a time of sorrow, pain, yet God can bring joy to us too. So there's joy even in the midst of our sorrow. 1 John 2, verse 18. <clears throat> Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would do, no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you, because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, in that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide you in you which ye have heard from the beginning, 
If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And now the text for this morning. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Thus far we read the word of God. May God bless us as we consider those first three verses this morning of chapter 3. When we hear of how the Apostle John, by inspiration of the Spirit, calls us children, little children, and refers to God as Father, we are reminded of the fact that our God is a family God. He's a Father, and He has a family. And in that family, we are His children. The triune God has shown us love in this. A love that we are commanded to Behold, stop and think about the greatness of this love that God is our Father and we are called His children. What a gift, what a treasure that helps us keep a proper perspective on our earthly families We tend to have some family pride, and our earthly families are important, created by God. God has given us the gift to enjoy of husband and wife relationships, parent-child relationships, brother and sister relationships, and these families can be a source of not just happiness, but pride. But we must remember, as much as we think highly of our earthly families, they are but pictures of the real family, the spiritual family of God that we are privileged to belong to with our children. The text is reminding you, commanding you to put this before Hallie. To see how God loves her, loves us so greatly as his children. To put us in his family. So that you are to say to her, behold, this is your identity. Yes, you're the daughter of Tyler and Brianna. But ultimately, the daughter of God. And not only is this your privilege and your identity, but now let this be your life. So let's consider this this morning briefly under the theme, Behold the Father's Love. Behold the Father's Love. First of all, in adopting us, stop and think about that. He calls us His children. Secondly, in assuring us, we know this. That we are his children, he's our father. 
And thirdly, in transforming us. And we'll see how much time we have for that third point this morning. Behold, you understand the meaning of that word in the scriptures? Stop and look at this and be amazed what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you. And John speaks of God as the Father. The Father, not just a Father. There's no other Father like this Father. This is the only eternal Father. Even Adam in the beginning had to become a father. He wasn't created a father. He was given a wife, but he didn't become a father until Cain was born. Our God doesn't become a father. He is the father. In all eternity, the father begets the son. He did not become a father, that means, when he created Adam and Eve. He did not become a father when he adopted any of his redeemed people to be his people. He is the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as the triune God, now he is our Father. And to say that, beloved, is to say, as much as any son or daughter might take pride in their earthly father, do you understand that's nothing compared to this? This is the greatest privilege that any human being could have to be able to say, the Father, that is the, only, the one and only Father who is eternal, the one and only Father who is God, the one and only Father who has all knowledge and wisdom and all power and might, the God of heaven and earth, that Father is our Father. This is the greatest question then really, in anyone's life. Does this Father love me? Don't think about the world. Do they love me? We're going to see they won't. And don't think either about other human beings. Does he love me? Does she love me? So this morning, think about God. Is he my Father. And John wants us to think about the love of God in this that he put into action. This is wonderful. This is beautiful. John was the disciple that Jesus loved. We think of him in connection with love. And now he's going to speak to us about something deep and mysterious, love. And it's very easy, isn't it, when speaking about the subject of love to become a bit philosophical, maybe a bit abstract, and maybe even to feel like this is not very concrete, not very practical. What is this thing, love? But then John comes to us and he doesn't speak to us as a philosopher. He doesn't speak in highfalutin terms about love. He comes and speaks very practically, very concretely. He says, you can understand the manner, the, the action, the, the love of God in action and the greatness of that love when you think of this. That he calls you the children of God. And I want to be clear about what we have here in verse 3 when the text says that we should be called the sons of God. That's not the Greek word, sons, but the Greek word is the word children. And even if it was sons, we understand this would include the, the, the girls, the females. But that's very clearly what John had in mind when he used the word for children, so that really it's that we should be called the sons and daughters of God, if you want to put it that way, or simply the children of God. How do you respond to that? 
the Father, the eternal Father, calls me my child? Can you sense why John would put this behold on this? Stop and see this for the great act of love that it is. It speaks of God's love and action in rescue of us. Rescue from what, you ask? Well, you understand I wasn't. God's son or daughter by nature. I was of the father of lies, the devil. What family do you belong to? Well, by nature, the family of Satan, of sin, of death, the world, here in the text. Even in one place in Scripture, called the child of wrath. I belong to that family that is under the wrath of God, deserving of eternal condemnation and hell. And in His justice, we confess that, don't we? In His justice, this eternal Father, the Father who is holy and righteous, could say to me, not my son, and you stay under wrath. You never obeyed me. You never showed any interest in me. You never loved me. I leave you in the world and the everlasting misery that you deserve. Behold, what manner of love that God says, I rescue you from that. I snatch you away from that. When I call you son, daughter, I'm saying to you, you're no son of Satan. You're no daughter of sin. You're no daughter of this world. You're mine. You hear the love in that, don't you? A father who rescues his children from a burning home, perhaps. But here's the father who rescues you from guilt and sin and death. And this includes our children. And our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And then, and there's so much more to say, beloved, but in the second place, we'll say this. Think of what he has bestowed on you in saying now, having rescued you from this status of a sinner lost in the world belonging to Satan, I'm going to deliver you unto this status of what? Of being an orphan who is a foster child? A servant, my child. And now think of that even in earthly terms. This is the beauty, by the way, of earthly adoption. We understand this, don't we? That there's nothing that a man or a woman in this world can do in this world to say to an orphan, I love you any more than this, saying, this is how much I love you. I'm not just going to bring you into my home and say, you can eat my food and you can, uh, I'll take you shopping and I'll buy you clothing and I'll pay for your education and things like that. No, no, when you come into this home, I'm adopting you and you see my other sons and daughters, I'm giving you their status. You're going to be my son, my daughter. That's what God is doing here. He's saying, look at the love I've bestowed upon you and saying the status of, and he only has one son by nature. 
the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And you and I know the greatness of Jesus Christ. You and I know that we are nothing like Him, that we deserve nothing that He has or that He is. And yet God says, oh yes, this is how much I love you. This Son, Jesus Christ, whom I call my Son, I'm giving you His status. And think of what That means the rights and the privileges you have. When God says, I give you the right to be my son, my daughter, he's saying, I give you the right to the blood of Christ. Whenever you sin, you may come to me and ask me forgiveness in his name. And when you have a child, you may present that child for baptism to receive the sign of water as a picture that you and your child are washed by the blood of Christ from all your sins. When God says, you're my son, my daughter, do you see, I've already kind of covered this, he gives you the right to prayer. You may talk to God. That's no small privilege. This is yours. All the truth of the Bible, God's Word, every command, every admonition, but also every promise. This isn't for the world. No, God has given His testimony, His Word, to Israel in the Old Testament and to His church in the New Testament, to His sons and His daughters. This is all yours. We're going to look at this more in the second point. But he's given you heaven. This isn't a gift for the outcasts, the foreigners, the strangers to God. But when he calls you son, he says, I call you daughter. He's saying the inheritance that is Christ, which includes heaven, is yours. Oh, in the world too, the meek shall inherit the earth. Now you live here and the people of the world make you feel like you don't belong, like you're a stranger. The Bible says, well, here's the truth. Those people who are not the sons and daughters of God, they're the imposters. They're the intruders. God's going to drive them out. He's going to remake this world the earth, and give it to sons and daughters. And so I say again, to be a son of God means the Father not only rescued you from death, but He gives you the status of one of His children. And then thirdly, in this first point, behold the love of God in all of this through Jesus Christ, his son. Here in chapter 3, John is telling us about the love of God and that we weren't his sons and daughters and he has adopted us. How? Well, John chapter 4, 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I'm not going to dwell on that. It's enough just to say it, isn't it? Behold, how great the love of God in action for you. That he withheld not his only begotten son, but sent him. That he would bear the wrath that you deserve. And deliver you from that. And then adopt you as his son in or daughter in Jesus Christ. We're not children of wrath. We're children of God. Through Jesus Christ. Behold God's love. And he assures us. 
calling us children in verse 1. And then saying, this is what we are in verse 2. Behold, now are we the children of God. The idea is not merely that God chose us to be his children. That happened in eternity before we existed. And the idea is not that God has merely redeemed us to be his children. That happened 2,000 years ago. We were reminded of that at the cross. Jesus paid for all of our sins. But when the text tells us that God has called us, this is referring to something that God does in the here and now and that he does in a way that we may be conscious of it. He calls us. And he says to us in a way that we hear him as he anoints us. We read of that in our scripture reading. He has given us an unction, an anointing with the Holy Spirit to renew us, to give unto us spiritual ears to hear so that when God says, come to me, you are mine, we hear him. And when he says, son, daughter, Make sure that you respond this way. That when John says, we are the sons of God, that you are saying that with him. This is me. This is us. We are the children of God. This is your work as parents. Be God's tools to call your children to believe in Him, to know Him, that He is their Father. Now that includes the work of the church, of course, and the preaching of the gospel. And so those of us who are responsible for ourselves before God. That's why we need to come to church. But as parents, this is why we need to bring our children to church so that under the preaching of the gospel, God will summon them. Come to me, believe in Jesus, and know that He's your Savior and that God is your Father. And yes... It is a privilege to be able to send our children to Christian schools where the teachers are also used by God as a means to call the children in the classroom. What? They can be difficult. They show they have sinful natures. But what we expect of our Christian school teachers is this, isn't it? You're the children of God. That's how I'm going to teach you. That's how I'm going to expect you to behave. But ultimately, do this in your home. In your instruction, discipline and care for your children, bring them up as the children of God. Now, the assurance has to do with the future, and, well, maybe someday verse 2 will be the subject of a whole sermon, but it will have to be brief here. But John tells us, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. That's a grief to us. We still have sin. That's not what we shall be, though. We won't have sin. We still have mortal bodies. That's not what we shall be. No, we know. Hear the assurance? That when He shall appear. Now you have to go back to verse 28 of chapter 2. When He shall appear. That's talking to us about the second coming of Jesus. 
when he comes, when he appears, and you understand that word appears brings with it the idea, we're going to see him. We will see Jesus when he comes. And what will we see? Well, he never had any sin, of course. And he still has no sin. But we're going to see the Son of God in his glorified, resurrected, heavenly body. And then, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Your sins will be purged from you. Your body will be renewed. And forever, you and I will be the image of the Son of God. What a hope. What love. Again, this bears repeating. Even in an earthly family, for a father to say, I'm going to give you the status of my son and all the rights and privileges of my sons and daughters. This is what our future is. This is what God guarantees. But now understand that this is an assurance that we have in the present. We're thinking about the future, but as we're living in this world, we are saying, this is what I know. I know that I am a son of God, a daughter of God, and I know that I have the hope of eternal life in heaven, that body and soul I will be like Jesus and live forever in the Father's house. And this, beloved, does not change. I emphasize that this morning. This world has its ups and its downs. And I wonder how many of you to this morning feel like you're down. When you think of the church, you think of your family, you think of your health, you think of your sin and your guilt. Take hold of this. No matter what happens today, would no matter no matter what happens tomorrow, these two things won't change about me or you. God calls me his child. And I know that when Christ shall appear, I will be made like him. That's assurance for today and in every circumstance of life. And that assurance is based on the love of God. I can't emphasize that enough. Always look to the love of God. What do you see when you examine yourself this morning? Some of you may say, the only thing I can see when I look at myself is all of my weaknesses, my shortcomings, my sins, and my failures. John would say to you, then look up and behold the love of God. God didn't call you because you were so good. God didn't love you because you loved him. God loved you. He sent Jesus for you. God has redeemed you and God has now called you his son or daughter only for the sake of his love. What about when you see some good in yourself? And don't overlook that. John speaks of the fact that those who are called by God, loved by God, they will begin to love God. They will begin to love the brethren. This will be the evidence that you have been loved by God and redeemed by God. So don't overlook this. Don't think that this is unimportant. It doesn't matter. If all I see in my life is sin, I don't see any love for God or any love for the brethren or any good works in my life. No, no, John says, if you're born of God, you will do righteousness. And then people, when you speak of our good works, our love for God, our love for other people, as an evidence of our salvation, will say, oh, so you're assuring your salvation on the basis of what you see in yourself? And the answer to that is no. A thousand times no. 
I'm still only assured on the basis of the love of God. And how does that work? You know, don't you? When you say, in whatever good work you do, I've loved God. Now, I'm never going to claim that my love for God is a great love for God. It's always weak, tainted with sin. But when you say, I have loved God, or I have loved my neighbor, do you end there and say, wow, I look at myself, I'm good, I'm assured? No. But as a believer, you say, this can only mean that God has loved me so much that he has redeemed me and that he's at work in my life for Jesus' sake. So that whether I look at myself and see all my weaknesses and my failures, or whether I look at myself and I see some evidence of the new life of God in me, I say to myself, behold the love of God. That's the only reason I'm saved. And because that love is eternal, and because that love never fails, I'm sure. And beloved, if you find yourself struggling with assurance, there may be many reasons for that. But this morning I point out only one probable reason. And that is that you're looking at yourself and focusing on yourself and not looking at the love of God in Jesus Christ. He loves us, He adopts us, He assures us, He transforms us. Now where's the love in that? Can you imagine living in a family, beloved, where everyone says we're a family, but we hate each other? God does not bring us into that kind of a family. We see that kind of a family everywhere in the world. Sometimes, too often, our families can be like that. Spouses against each other. Parents and children against each other. Brothers and sisters against each other. And God is not that kind of a father. He's the kind of a father who says, I'm a God of love. I love you. And now I not only call you to love each other, but behold the manner of the love of God that he gives us the power to transform us. And we may love him and love each other and live in peace and unity and blessedness. This comes out two ways briefly in the text. First of all, we are told at the end of verse 1, Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now, that speaking of the fact that the world is going to hate us, the world's going to look at us as strange, the world is going to say, You're different. And we as Christians can look at that from two points of view. One is, that causes suffering and pain. That's persecution. That's hard. That makes our life difficult. But the second perspective is, wait a minute. Every time the world expresses hatred for me, I should view that as God saying to me, Ah, I love you. I've loved you enough to take you out of the world and to make you different from the world. So let me leave it at that. Teach your children to be different from the world and teach them that when the world rejects them, shows it hates them, teach them to see that as that's God at work. Saving me from the world, transforming me to be different from the world. And then finally this, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Beloved, You are not driven to sanctification, to purification, to put sin out of your life and to live in good works unto God in order to save yourself. No, the only way to motivate our children, to motivate ourselves to be pure, to serve God is to remember salvation is His gift to us. And in that salvation, in the second place, we get to reflect Him, to look like Him. A 
The father's great love for his son is that he says, you're my son. And now I care for you and all that I have is yours. And the son's great love, the daughter too, for her father is this. And father, I want to be like you. That's what John is saying. As he is pure, be pure. Isn't that your desire? Let that be your desire. May God bless his word to our hearts and families. Amen. Father in heaven, send thy word forth with us to comfort us and assure us and to transform us and our children. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalter number 27. Let's sing the five stanzas. Psalter number 27, five stanzas. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.